Sunday night, we're still talking about the book of Revelation, and we're tying some other books in with it, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and uh, other prophetic books. We've been on the book of Revelation for, I believe it's over 150 weeks uh, on Sunday night. And before I begin our study, or continuing our study on Revelation, I am talking to you about the culture of the first century, and I'm reading something to you. I'm reading to you out of this book called uh, Manners and Customs of Bible Lands. Has everybody got this? It's a really good book. It's the easiest reading book on culture and customs that I've got. I've read all kinds of books, and the guys will get complex, and and this is a good book, but even Paul's Metaphors by David Williams, or even Sketches of the Jewish Social Life by uh, Alfred Edersheim, I mean, he's one of my favorite writers. None of them are as simple as this man makes, the customs and the culture. We're talking about Israel in the first century. Now, the Bible is about Israel. The Old Testament is about literal Israel. Uh, it starts with God giving the covenant to Abraham there in Genesis. The Well, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, he promises it to him. And Abraham is in the lineage of Noah, or in his the lineage of his son Shem. And he's a great, 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 great grandson of Shem, the second born of Noah. And Noah's in the lineage of Seth, who took the place of Adam, or excuse me, took the place of Abel, whom Cain slew, slew. So this is Abel's lineage, according to the Jewish customs. And, uh, and uh, we've been talking about, of course, Abraham received this promise from God, and then that was extended to Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob became Israel. And then Israel goes out there, and uh, when they're a nation, they go off into, into idolatry of all kinds and worship the tree and the sun, God scatters them over the earth, and then the prophets prophesied to them about their apostate ways, and all the prophets have basically the same message. That's basically the Old Testament, what I just said to you. That's basically it. And then the New Testament is about Israel. It's about the New Testament Israel or the church. And uh, what I'm doing, and of course Israel, here is Israel on the eastern end of what they call the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. This is Israel right there. This boundary right there is Israel. And east of Israel is Jordan. Jordan is the old land of Moab and Ammon. And Syria up here and Lebanon right above Israel. And right below Israel is this Sinai Peninsula where Moses came out of Egypt, went across the Reed Sea. It's not actually Red Sea, but the Reed Sea. And came down here to Sinai, received the law, and went for 40 years in the wilderness and came back to Canaan. Here's Iraq over here. Iraq is the same as Babylon. Here's Saudi Arabia. Of course, Iraq, uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates comes down from northwest, comes down southeast, and the Tigris comes down the same way, and they meet right here just above Kuwait, about 75 miles up in from the Persian Gulf up in this area here. And then Iran is over here. Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan on this map. You really need to get used to this, and I think our people get used to this more than anybody else. (coughs) That uh, here's Saudi Arabia, Iraq. And Iraq is the old kingdom of Babylon. Of course, Babylon was ruling as a as a kingdom, but the city of Babylon was on the Euphrates River there, right, just above the Persian Gulf. And then Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, those three nations comprised in the ancient world what was called Persia or the Mede-Persian Empire. So we need to learn those things in order to really have an understanding what the Bible's about. Well, Everyone was oppressing Israel or causing Israel to go after their gods. And Israel had a culture, a custom. Israel had the old Hebrew Chaldean language. And the Chaldean language 
was an ancient Assyrian language. And, uh, of course, during the time of Christ, they were speaking, most of the world was, some of the Romans were speaking Latin, and most of the world was speaking some dialect of the Greek, and then they had the Hebrew language that when Israel was carried into captivity, that the rabbis had made the, in their eyes, they had made the Hebrew language a holy language. And when they came back, no one was using the Hebrew when they came back from the captivity. And in the first century during Jesus' days, people say, could Jesus speak Hebrew? Jesus could speak anything. He was God. But he didn't. He wasn't communicating with people because that was not a popular language. It was kind of a, you wouldn't call it dead because a dead language is one that no one uses. But the Hebrew language was used by the Pharisees that ran the temple in southern Judah and they would uh, read the law in Hebrew and then you had the Aramaic which was a dialect of the Hebrew and you had some other many other languages you had a different dialect of the Greek language in all the cities around the world and you had other foreign languages of various kinds which were called glossa or it was translated into the King James as the word tongue now I'm reading to you about slavery out of the manners and customs of the Jews. And let me continue reading what I was reading about slavery so we can understand because we're talking about when you're reading in Revelation and you're talking about the beast, you're talking about a slave because the slaves had a mark on their head or in their ear or on their hand to show who they belonged to and whose law they were subject to. And... uh, When you see the mark of the beast in a man's hand or his forehead, and it's not talking about a literal mark, it's talking about ownership. And if a person is owned by someone, they're obedient. When you see mark, I haven't said it this way, and I keep looking for ways to tell you. When you see mark or karagma, karagma, which is the word mark, It means to etch or to grave. You need to think. It means to grave and to engrave. And where God engraves his law is in our minds. He said, I'm going to write my law in your mind. And he says that in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 and all throughout the Old Testament. He said, I'm going to write my law in your mind. So he etches or graves or engraves his law in our minds. And that is to put the mark between the eye. So when you think of the mark of the beast or the mark of God, you need to think of two other words, ownership. Ownership. And if God owns us, the Bible says you there in the last verse of the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, you are not your own. You don't own yourself. You're bought with a price. We were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he owns us. And when someone owned a slave, they had to obey them. So you need to think of obedience and ownership when you're thinking of the mark. It's not just talking about, well, here's the mark of the beast. It's something that's evil and it's coming out of this fire-breathing dragon and it's blowing smoke and it's going, ooh, It's real scary. The mark is scary. No, it shows ownership. It shows who owns you. And we're talking about, and you need to think, slave, slave, ownership, obedience, and slave. And Paul, when he would start out, most of his, when he would start most of his epistles, he would say, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, When we think of a servant, we're thinking of some guy that's hired and gets paid to do something. That's not the word that Paul used. Paul used the word D-O-U-L-O-S, and it's the word slave. Paul said, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. He used the word prisoner, prisoner there in, prisoner in the third chapter of Ephesians, He said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And of course, we are in Ephesians, the third chapter. And we're prisoners because uh, 
we were darkness, darkness, and now are we light. We were slaves of the darkness. God has made us slaves of the light. And what we have a tendency to do, we like to wander back into darkness from time to time till God beats us severely and makes us keep going back over into the light. And the light is the horizo. And horizo is the word bound or to bound inside the horizon. And prohorizo, of course, is the word predestinate. So we were slaves of darkness. Now we're slaves of light. When people talk about America's free, freedom, uh, we, got, we got freedom here, nothing is free. You know, you're not free to do anything you want to do. You have to live by the, we are slaves to the American system, the American way of life, and American laws. You actually think you're free? You're not free. Nobody's free. We're all slaves to a law that's in our mind. And we all have a mark in our mind. When you want to get down to the mark of the beast, we've got a mark before our foreheads. When we see red lights, we know that means to stop. You pull up behind a school bus and it stops. You, if you live in America, you know you better not drive around that school bus. And some police officers say you, you might go to jail for that. Now, we, that's already in our minds. That's similar to what the mark of the beast is. We know these things and we know the mark of God. Let me read this to you about slaves. Protection of the slave. I've read to you a little bit introduction on the slave. Let me tell you about something about the protection of the slave. The Mosaic Code contains various regulations that protect the rights and privileges of slaves. For, for instance, a fugitive slave law was quite favorable to the slave and was designed to protect him from oppression. Now, when we think of slaves in America, we think of the black man being a slave for hundreds of years and being abused and oppressed and trodden down. Well, God actually even had an approval on slavery, but not of abusive slavery, and particularly on bond slaves. When you owed somebody a lot of money and you couldn't pay it back, you could put your children or your wife or yourself into a bond, as a bond slave to them and work this out over a period of years, particularly seven years, to work out a debt. All the religious privileges enjoyed by free Israelites were assured to their slaves, including the rest of the Sabbath in Exodus 20 and 10. The slaves were to be permitted to rest on the Sabbath, along with the animals. <coughs> the right to attend the national festivals in Deuteronomy 16, 10, and 11 and the right to attend the gathering of the people to hear the reading of the law was given to slaves in Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 13. Now, why the Mosaic law permitted slavery instead of abolishing it? He goes into this. Let me read this too. Get me a drink of water here. Why the Mosaic law permitted slavery? Of course, being a slave, we read this last week in, in uh, Paul's metaphors. Being a slave didn't necessarily mean you were being abused. If, and you have to understand during that first century, whoops, during that first century, life was very hard. People were very poor. It was very difficult to live in Israel. Sometimes if a rich man owned you, and they allowed you to have good jobs and to prosper and to profit, you would be better off sometimes in the first century being a slave because slaves were not necessarily abused. Most of them were looked after as a piece of, of uh, collateral that the, that the slave master owned them, and they took care of them, allowed them jobs, allowed them education, allowed them to prosper, and sometimes you could be a slave and make more money and have a better future and have a better career than if you were on your own because you were just going to be another poor guy out there in Israel eking out a living, plowing some furrow with, a, with an ox. But if you were owned by the right man, 
you can end up being rich as a slave back in the first century. So when we say slave, when they said slave, it didn't have the same connotation. When the laws were given at Mount Sinai, slavery was universal among the nations of the world. It was not practical to do away with it all at once. Rather, laws were given to prevent the worst abuses and evils of it from being present among the Jews. W.M. Taylor has this to say in regard to the relation of the law to slavery, divorce, etc. It is noticeable, however, that wherever things in themselves questionable are tolerated because they were too deeply seated to be removed by an immediate prohibition, the legislation regarding them is of a character as to mitigate the evils and to prepare the way for their ultimate repression. In other words, to get rid of the evil parts of slavery. Slavery actually was a way sometimes of lifting a person up out of his poverty and out of his struggles. And that's what the slavery to Christ does to us, doesn't it? It lives us out of the poverty of sin. The wisdom of such a policy is seen in the actual influence of the Mosaic legislation upon slavery among the Jews. Due to this influence, slavery among the Jews themselves had virtually disappeared by the time of Christ and his disciples. Many of the Jews, slavery under Israel's enemies. Let me read this, and then I'll get on with the lesson tonight. Many of the Jews experienced slavery under foreign rule in the time of the captivities. They became captives of war to the Phoenicians who sold them to the Greeks, and the Philistines captured them, and they then delivered them up to Edom in Amos 1 and 6. When the Assyrians conquered Samaria... Many of the Jews were taken away to the land of Assyria. And we've talked about that a bunch of times. Many of the Jews were taken away to the land of Assyria to serve as slaves of that people in 2 Kings 17 and 6. That's when northern Israel was carried into captivity. When Jerusalem was destroyed, the Babylonians... Now, we, how many times have we talked about that? Bunches of times. The, that was in 586 B.C., when Jerusalem was destroyed, the Babylonians carried away to Babylon many Hebrews to become their slaves in this foreign capital, Second Chronicles 36 and 20. At a later date, the Syrian merchants came into camp in order to secure Jewish slaves in 1 Maccabees 3 and 41 in the Apocrypha. And in the days of Rome's supremacy, many Jews served as slaves of the empire, but slavery under Gentile dominion was indeed altogether different from slavery under the Mosaic law. Masters were for the most part cruel, and slaves were usually oppressed greatly unless they did have a good master that looked out for them. And some of them permitted them to become very wealthy and to be a, a part of their system and leave their wealth sometimes to them. All right, I'm going to come back next week and continue this. Now, we're talking about, and I'm taking my time. Sometimes you say, Jim, you take so much time going through Revelation. I have never taken this much time on anything other than predestination on Wednesday night. We've been on predestination for, that's a concept. I never have put this much time into one book. And we've been on the book of Revelation for three years on Sunday night. Now, we're in the 13th chapter. Let's go back over there. Let's go back over there. Now, we're talking about, and the, the popular chapter concerning the mark of the beast is the 13th chapter of Revelation. This is the popular chapter, the one that everybody always quotes and probably the most, I won't say quoted verse, the most confusing verse that people discuss in all the Bible more than any other verse as far as its meaning and understanding, well, I hate to say the most. It's probably the most, I, I can talk about the spirits in prison, among the scholars the spirits in prison from First Peter, 
the third chapter, would be the most controversial uh, passages among the scholarly theologians, doctors of theology in the seminaries. But among just the average person, probably the most puzzling verse of the Bible is in this 13th chapter of Revelation. And it would be that 18th verse. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And how many people have commented on that? I was going through the checkout counter at Cargo one uh, night, and uh, and I said, "What's the date?" And it was six six oh six. And she said, "Oh, six six six." I said, "Well, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, no more than walking under a ladder, a black cat running, walking in front of your path." And uh, people will come up and think that if it's got 666 in it, it's, it's mysterious or a mystique. And they've made movies about it many, many, many times. They did that movie, The Omen. And that was the stupidest movie that they ever made about 666 because the beast was a man. It wasn't a system. And he had 666 up here in his forehead. And he's supposed to be the world leader of the world. And all he ever got to in the movie was ambassador to Great Britain. So, I mean, that doesn't sound like the beast to me. But, uh, of course, it's not. It's not. Now, we've got in, there's several titles for the man that's the head of the beast world system. And the beast has got several things that, re, that, is, that is referred to. Of course, the beast is, the beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, it's only Rome because Rome overthrew Greece and adopted the Grecian sun and tree worship system and their system of ruling the world. And it was only Greece because Greece overthrew Persia and became the world ruling system. And it was only Persia because Persia overthrew Babylon and became the system after Babylon. So these are all the same system. They are one beast. It's what it is. It's one beast, and the beast had one purpose. The beast's purpose was to cut down Israel. Evil men are a sword in the hand of God, David says in Psalms, the 17th chapter. Now, Babylon was the, was the regal, was the most majestic of all empires. And Babylon was... Uh, represented as a lion, which is supposed to be the majestic of the majesty of all animals. Let me get me a, another pen. Something's not working here. Hold on. And then, of course, as we've said, as we said, the beast was, it was the Persian bear and of course, the bear is the largest of all carnivores. And the Persians had the largest armies. They would run two and a half million in an army at once to go out and conquer their enemies. And then Greece was represented as the leopard. And the le the, it's represented as a leopard because of the leopard's agility as a killer and the way it goes in and conquers and stalks its prey. The leopard is a lone hunter and it, hunt, it hunts only when it's hungry. And the leopard will kill its prey to eat it every time. And uh, they always accomplish what they go after. And then, well, the majority of the time they do. They're, the lion will miss the kill much of the time. The uh, male lion sits back and waits while the female kills the dinner and brings it home. And then he takes it away from her. Now, that's what the male lion 
is a lazy bum. That's what he is. <laughs> he sits around. He doesn't do any of the killing unless it just becomes absolutely necessary. I saw a special one night uh, on uh, Discovery on lions and on, on hyenas and lions. And these hyenas are extremely dangerous. And it showed this one hyena uh, that kept just tantalizing one of the female leaders of the pride. And just kept on and she kept chasing it. She couldn't chase She couldn't catch it. And uh, just kept on. And she just was uh, getting exhausted. And this hyena was just like laughing at her. And then the narrator said, he will do this and tantalize the pride until Simba has had enough. And it showed this big lion come charging out of the brush, said nothing could get away from him. And he chased that hyena down and, and just snapped his neck with one bite. Hey, it's over. <laughs> you know, get away from my women. They're hunting for me. <laughs> but uh, just, I mean, the size of him was just so much bigger than all these others. And he wouldn't go. Of course, a hyena is, ext- is not like, a hyena doesn't have the bite of a pit bull. I mean, it's got a bite that that's in comparable to anything else over there in the jungle other than one of those lions you know so that's why these that's why these kingdoms are compared with animals and then the third when you find this in Daniel 7 I keep saying this Daniel 7 Hosea 13 and in uh, in Revelation 13 when you find the lion the bear and the leopard it was, it was a world system over here. It, it was a world system here in Daniel 7 and Hosea 13. It has to be a world system here. It is called an it over here, but when you get over here to Revelation 13, it's called a him. Well, that's because of a bad translation there in the 13th chapter when you see the beast was like a lion, a bear, and a leopard in verse 2, and then... The Bible says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Well, it shouldn't be his because the word is A-U-T-O-U. And autu can be neuter gender or it can be masculine gender. And the way you tell is you go with the gender of the antecedent. And the antecedent, all, I want to say it again, all pronouns. An antecedent is what the pronoun is referring back to. That's what it means. And when you find him all through here, it's referring back to the beast. That word the beast in verse 2, that's what it's referring to. And you always have to look back and see what the pronouns are referring to. And it mystifies me why they translated he and him. Because when you look it up in your interlinear Bible, it says it. Huh? That's what now? Yeah, if anything, yeah. But she would have been, would have been uh, in the sense of the religion, and it is in the sense of the religion, it's a she. But when you're, when you're talking about the beast, it's neuter gender, therefore this has to be it all the way through here. It's a world system. Then you've got, then you've got another name for the beast. You've got a couple of more names, serpent. Serpent, the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field. Well, if the dragon gives the beast its power, its seat, and it's speaking like a throne and great authority, if the dragon or dracon, D-R-A-K-O-N, which means to fascinate, and serpent, Nakos from Genesis 3, then Nakos means to enchant or make someone feel good. Satan's message is always a feel good message. And what really fools us is the terminology of a King James Bible. We see dragon because we've always thought of dragons as those flying creatures that they painted on the sides of buildings and they parade them in China. And we think of Great Britain back in the Middle Ages when uh, St. George and the dragon and dragons were fought by the knights and a bunch of fairy tales and myths. 
That's what we think of when we think of dragon. We don't think of smooth-talking, seducing seducers. Well, there's another name that I want to put up here for the beast, and you would, could call it Leviathan. And Leviathan had... Uh, Leviathan is equated with... It's, uh, it's an abstract term. Because it's equated with more than just some... When you start studying Leviathan, you study Leviathan, people will try to come up and say, well, Leviathan was, was the whales. Some say it's whales. And some say that Leviathan was uh, the crocodile. The crocodile. Or it was some big animal in the sea. Now, we've been studying demons on Wednesday night. In the ancient world, they said that the whale was a demon. Was a demon. And they called the whale Dagon. And dag is the word, a dog is the word fish. It's the word fish. And Dagon was the god of the Philistines. And they would call the Leviathan whales. Some called them crocodiles. And of course, they, they called the whale, they would also call the whale, uh, identify it with some spirit being out there in the Mediterranean. And the reason for this is they did not understand the great deep out here when the Lord would tell the apostles, launch out into the deep, when he would tell them at the third watch of the morning, which was like three o'clock in the morning, go out there and go across the lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and get in that boat down there. And it's in the early morning. They were terrified of the Mediterranean. That's because before they had sextants, A sextant is an instrument they used to plot the stars. Before they had these things, I've done some study on this. Some of the writers said that they, they were afraid to take out across the sea. They knew from traveling around the sea that what we call Turkey or Asia Minor was there, and they knew Greece was over here. But they didn't know what was out here, and they thought that the great Leviathan was out here, in the sea, and that it was, they didn't understand whales. They thought they were mean, evil creatures. And they said that at the bottom of the Mediterranean, that there was a gate to hell. And if you were swallowed up by one of these Leviathans out here, which many of them identified with the whales, that it would take you down to the gates of hell and put you in hell. And that's the very reason that Jonah said, out of the belly of hell cried I. That was an idiom to them. It didn't mean he was literally in hell or he wasn't using that as an expression. He believed he was at the belly of hell according to the culture and the customs of that day. And they believed all the sea was very evil at night. And they said that the sea and the waters was a great serpent that wound around the earth and at night, they certainly didn't want to go out there because in the daytime, they wouldn't go out across the sea. Sometimes if they could see an island over there, they'd take out for that island. But if some storm hit, they'd be like Paul in the 28th chapter of Acts. They'd get, the winds would blow them around and they'd get shipwrecked and they had no way of seeing where the storm was coming from until it hit them. Well, they believed that seas had all kinds of spirits in them. And they believed that uh, when they saw Jesus on the water, walking on the water, after he had told them to go out there in the sea, they looked and said, it's a spirit. And the, it's the only time that I've been able to find that the word spirit is not translated pneuma. And pneuma means breath, but that's not the word they used. They used the word phantasm, P-H-A-N-T-A-S-M, which means we get our word fantasy 
And when they said phantasm, they meant it was a demon or it was some spiritual being out there on the sea and they identified the whales and all kinds of creatures out there. They were so frightened of the sea before they had these instruments that if they were going to travel from Egypt over here to Greece, they didn't take out across the sea. They were too frightened to do that. They would get a couple of three miles offshore and then follow the shoreline around until they got up there. They'd follow it all around until they could get over here to Greece. So they were frightened of the deep, and particularly the big fish in the deep. In fact, you remember when Jules Verne, his book, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, back in the 1800s when he wrote that, I mean, more or less prophesying the submarine, when he wrote that, they were frightened of the creatures in the sea back then. And they were all, and we know even in the early 1900s when uh, the killer whale, it was discovered, wasn't a mean creature. And the reason they called it the killer whale because it did such devastating work on all the other creatures in the sea. The most independent creature in the sea is the killer whale. I mean, even above the great white, I saw a, I saw a, a, a special documentary on a, on a battle between a great white shark and a killer whale. And the great white shark was like a little kitten to him. I mean, that killer whale was all over him, just tore him to pieces. They don't have a chance. And we thought because the killer whale was that kind of, an, the orca was that kind of an animal with that kind of power, even we thought up till the early 1900s that it was a vicious creature. Now we know that it is a very gentle animal to us. Very gentle. But it's a terror to every other animal in the sea. If it decides to go after them, they're uh, a great white is dead meat to, to an orca. And, uh, but I'm just trying to point out how we think of these things. So when they thought this, it's taken us till the 20th century to learn some of these things ourselves. Now, I want us to look at this Leviathan. Because that's another name for the beast. And, and it also can apply in the sense. When you're studying Bible, you're going to have to learn to study with the abstract attitude that the Jews and the Greeks wrote. When they looked at something, they kind of in, encompassed several things. It's like Leviathan can be applied to the beast as well as Satan at the same time. It can be the beast or Satan. Just like the same way, you, when you look at, at to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, when you look at Isaiah 14, you see there's a proverb, a proverb against the king of Babylon, king of Babylon. And what Isaiah 14 is telling us, it's telling us that, uh, that when the feller of the trees is destroyed, then they'll no longer have the curse of Babylon on them. Well, the feller of the trees is not just the lumberjack. It's the man who orders the trees to be felled or to be cut down, to be worshipped, and that was Belshazzar. So the 14th chapter of Isaiah is talking about Belshazzar, but at the same time, at the same time, you, you're, it's talking about Belshazzar all the way through there, and it will come up and say, in the middle of the chapter, how thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. And the heavens was the ruling powers, and Belshazzar had been the ruling power until he was destroyed. 
And when he said, I will send above the clouds, I will be like the Most High. And when the scripture says, how art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer's not referring to Satan. Lucifer's referring to Belshazzar being possessed with Satan. So in the sense, when you see Isaiah 14, it's talking about Belshazzar and Satan at the same time as being possessed within a man. And possession is not wallowing on the floor and spitting up and going like that. Possessed was the fact that was the fact that Belshazzar was the head of the Babylonian system, which kept the fire and tree worship going and prospering throughout the old ancient world, along with the Prince of Tyre that you find in Ezekiel 28. Well, the Prince of Tyre is equated, and of course it is. It says, uh, thou dwellest in the midst of the seas. When you look at pictures of ancient Tyre, uh, what we call Lebanon, it comes down like this, and then it shows Tyre out there in the middle of the sea. And Tyre is, well, it used, Tyre used to be an island out off of the coast of what we call Lebanon or Beirut, about where Beirut is. And, and, when, and when Greece, when Alexander the Great attacked Tyre, they built a road out there, and they, they had men just dumping dirt and rocks, and they were taking, they were under siege for a year and a half or two years uh, trying to take Tyre. So it's actually talking about Tyre, but when it calls the prince of Tyre, when it calls the prince of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, the anointed cherub that covereth, anointed cherub, and it says, Thou wast in the garden of God until and and you looked like you were innocent until till a, a sin was found in you. Well, that's certainly talking about the Prince of Tyre, because the fire and tree worship were kept prospering and thriving there in Tyre and Sidon. But he's equated with Satan. In that he, they keep the Garden of Eden worship or Babel worship going. And these two men are equated with Satan. Well, in the same fashion, you're going to see that Leviathan can be equated with the beast or Satan. And I'm just simply bringing that out so you can see that. Now, let's go over here and look. Let me give you some things before I get to the Job, the 41st chapter. Look over here in Psalms, the 74th chapter. Now, when you read a lot of these guys, they will come up and say things. Let me read something to you. But go to Psalms 74. Psalm 74. Seventy-four. Let me turn in my old Bible. I got some notes in my old Bible. Psalm 74. Now, before I read this, let me read something to you out of some articles on Leviathan. Now, when you're studying the Bible, let me tell you to do something. Don't always believe what you read out of an encyclopedia opposed to the context of Scripture. Context of Scripture is going to give you as much truth as the Greek or the Hebrew word or as somebody's going to give you out of a book. Now, what they will say certainly uh, certainly has to do with the subject. Let me give you, for instance, what I'm trying to talk about. Now, when you look up the word Leviathan in the Hebrew, Leviathan, let me erase this. L I V Y A L I V Y A T H A N. Now, this is what they say in Strong's a wreathed animal, a serpent, the crocodile, or some other large sea monster. 
the constellation of the dragon. Now, see, you're easing into abstractness there. The constellation of the dragon in the stars. Remember, I taught on Christ in the stars. And Leviathan in the stars would be a picture of Satan. In every culture of the ancient world, all the stars kept their same meanings. And I believe that Jesus was prophesied in the stars. But I'm not going to go into that tonight. The fact that you've got a dragon in the stars or Leviathan in the stars shows that this is more than just a crocodile that it's referring to. Also as a symbol of Babylon. Now, let me read to you what they'll say just out of McClintock and Strong. Leviathan, wreathed. Uh, it comes from Draco. Uh, it ha has the same meaning as Draco or Draco, which is the dragon. A serpent, especially a large one. Hence, as the symbol of the hostile kingdom of Babylon, the crocodile, a sea monster, tropically for a cruel enemy, the Hebrew word which denotes any twisted animal, is especially applicable to every great tenant of waters, such as the great marine serpents and crocodiles. And it may be added that the colossal serpents and great monitors of the desert, in general, it points to the crocodile in Job 41, is unequivocally descriptive of that saurian. Now, I believe it's more than a crocodile in, in the 41st chapter of Job. But in Isaiah, the Psalms, foreign kings are evidently uh, apostrophized under the name of Leviathan, though other texts more naturally apply to the whale. You have to study, when you're studying, Study the sea, study serpents, study dragons, study any word that's related to the subject you're studying. He says, some apply to the whale, notwithstanding the objections that have been made to that interpretation of the term. Well, of course, the pagans believed the whale was some kind of evil uh, entity. Let me, let me give you something else here. If I got something else. Now, Leviathan out of the theological word book. This is one of my favorite set of books. Gleason Archer is one of the writers, Harrison, Walkie, and Archer. And he says, uh, large aquatic animal, maybe the crocodile, maybe serpent, whale, usually rendered Leviathan or Leviathan appears six times in the Old Testament as a literal animal, a figure for Egypt, and a, and a figure for sinful mankind in general, derived from a root attested in the Arabic, L-W-Y, to twist or to wreath. And you know, when you stop and think about this, remember the word froward? It means to twist the word of God. Lawatan is reflected in Ugaritic, a monster called Lotan. Biblically, however, it appears only with other beasts, Nahash, the snake. Remember, Nahash or Nahash was the serpent in the garden that whispered, you have to think abstractly and figurative when you're thinking these things. Or Tanin, which is the word large serpent, there in Psalm 74, Yahweh overawed Job by confronting him with his invincible creature, Lawatan, and then he says, clearly the Nile crocodile with scaly hide. I don't believe that. I'll show you why I don't believe that. See, these guys will go too literally, and that's where me and a lot of them part ways because you have to stay abstract when you're studying this. It is described poetically. His sneezes flash forth light out of his nostrils. Smoke goes forth, but not mythologically. He spreads out like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the depths boil like a pot. And I'll show you why I, don't, I believe it's more than the crocodile in a minute. And he goes through much more here. But let's go to some of the verses. And you have to think this way when you're reading. Now look here in Psalms 74 and verse 14. Let's read 13 and 14. Well, let's back up just a little so we can get a hold of this. 
Verse 12, 74 Psalms. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Now, it certainly can be referring to a crocodile here, but let's look at some other verses. And, of course, he's talking about when they were coming out of Egypt. God very well may have given them the ability to feed on crocodiles. But look over here in Psalms 104. Look at Psalms 104. And you can't really get a full understanding of the Bible if you don't think abstract. When you think abstract, abstract is where you think figuratively so something can cover more than one area. When you think concrete, concrete is where you say, well, that's a table, that's all it is, and it won't be anything else but that, and that's all it'll ever be. If you say baptism is water, it's H2O, and that's where you dipped in water, it means to immerse in water, that's all it is. You come to a brick wall, and it doesn't mean a thing when Jesus said, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with the night before he died? Because it's dipped in water three and a half years before. You can't understand if you don't think abstract, figuratively. And we do a lot of that in our language. Now look here. Psalms 104 and verse 26. There, there go the ships. There is that Leviathan who thou hast made to play therein. Of course, that very well can be a whale or a crocodile in some sense. But you have to understand, just because a man God uses in a sense in one place, it doesn't mean he uses it in every place. Go to Isaiah 27 and 1. And this will really show you something here. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. Now look at this real close. Because this evidently has to do with a lot more than some whale in the sea. In that day, well let's back up to verse 20 of chapter 26. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. He's talking about the people that believe in Israel. Hide yourself for the judgment that's coming on Israel. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity when he brings, brings Nebuchadnezzar down upon Israel. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In that day when God brings judgment, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. Now, if what kind of evil... Does a crocodile do? It is not evil when a crocodile eats you whenever you get into its territory. You get into its territory and you are on its food chain and it has a right to eat you, just like a lion. They're not doing evil and they're not sinning. And they're not, fulfill, they're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. You're in the wrong spot. So therefore, you don't, Crocodiles don't sin. This is not talking about a crocodile here. He shall punish. And of course that word punish is the word pakad. P-A-Q-A-D. P-A-Q-A-D. Pakad. And it means to visit or to avenge, to oversee or to be hostile towards. God's not hostile to crocodiles. He created them. And if you could be big enough, 
if you have a, we got some little bitty dogs that are about this big, you know. If they were, if I was small enough, they would be monsters to me. They would eat me up. Well, that's the same thing with a crocodile. I said last week, when a crocodile gets near a uh, hippopotamus, a water horse, he's, he gets out of there real quick because hippopotamus will kill him with one bite, go through all that big hard skin, those foot and a half long incisors. As they said, that, uh, they had a special last week on hippos, and they said the hippopotamus is the ruler of the rivers in Africa and in Egypt. They, crocodiles, see them coming, they get out of there because they're dead. I mean, just boom like that. So uh, uh, if we were all big as hippopotamuses and had incisors this long, a crocodile would be like a little puppy around us. It'd be like a puppy dog going to want to lick us. I won't bite you. I won't even try. So it's not evil. I'm just saying this to point out Crocodiles aren't evil. Neither are lions, neither are lepers, neither are bears. They kill people because they want to eat. Now, he saw punish Leviathan, the piercing, uh, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. And that word serpent is nakash. Same word as serpent in the garden to enchant. That crooked serpent, that word crooked there means to rest wrong. It means tortuous. Literal animals don't do tortuous wrong. He said, and he goes on to say, he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. He's not talking about the literal dragon in the literal sea. There's a dragon that rises up out of the sea, and that is the beast. And the beast goes back to the garden. It's the serpent of the garden. And God's not talking about killing animals in the sea, is he? Why would God create animals for the sea? Say, so, well, I'm, they have incurred my rage. They went out here and ate up some little bitty fish, and we're going to execute them. Now let's go to the 41st chapter of Job. Job 41. So when you get to Isaiah, you can see that Leviathan is much more than some crocodile or a serpent. Now, I'm going to read the last verse of this chapter like I did last week. Then we're going to come back through it. 41st chapter of, of Job. All right. This chapter is the chapter in the Bible about Leviathan. It will tell you what Leviathan actually is. And it is the beast, and it is Satan, and it's a picture of Satan the beast. Now, look at that last verse of that chapter one more time so we can conclude something, that this is a part of the great beast system Look here in the last verse of the chapter. Speaking of Leviathan, he beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. Well, I don't care what men say. That's Crocodiles are not filled with pride. They're filled with hunger. Now let's go back to the first verse. And God is talking to Job. This is God. Always look in the previous chapter. Go back to Job 40 and verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? You're going to argue with God. He that reproveth God, you're going to... Reprove, reprove God, answer my question. You're going to contend with God and instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. So God is having a dialogue with Job here. And these are his words to Job 
because Job has instructed him in some way by saying, I am innocent. And like Elihu, not Elihu, but Eliphaz said, whoever perished being innocent, even though Eliphaz wasn't supposed to be saying it, that's true. Now look here in chapter 41, verse 1. Job, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? He's got a dual message here. Can you fish for a crocodile or a whale with a hook? Is this just an angler's catch? Can you catch Satan with a hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make supplication unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Now, the fact he's talking about speaking soft words, he's talking about more than just an animal. He has in mind the crocodile, but as I said, he's comparing him just like he's comparing Belshazzar with Satan, comparing the prince of Tyre with Satan, the anointed cherub that covereth, He's comparing the Leviathan with Satan, or he's comparing the crocodile. Can you, the literal Leviathan, it would be like a shadow in the very image. Will he make a covenant with thee? Well, that would be a preposterous thing to say if he's talking about something besides, if he's just only talking about a crocodile. Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? Can you control Satan this way? Now that's what I believe he's talking about here. It's not just, God's not just trying to have a, a, a zoology, zoology class with Job here. He's trying to say, Job, you're correcting me. You can't even correct Satan, much less me. Can you catch Satan with a hook? He says, lay thine hand upon him, remember the battle, do no more, behold the hope of him, is in vain. Shall not one be cast down at the sight of him? That's really not, if it were an animal, that really wouldn't apply, would it? People weren't cast down at the sight of a crocodile or a whale. If they saw it at a distance, they were fine. If they saw it in the water with them, it might frighten them. And then he compares... He says, none is so fierce that dare stir him up. There's been a lot of alligator wrestlers and crocodile wrestlers that don't mind tussling with them and knowing how to handle them. This wouldn't be true if he's, this is not true if he's just talking about a crocodile. Who then is able to stand before me? Now he's using an antithetical statement here. He's not comparing himself with a crocodile. If God is going to say something about himself, he's going to compare himself with Satan. Isn't he? You understand what I'm saying here? He wouldn't even make this statement comparing himself. That would be an insult to God himself to compare himself with a crocodile. No, what he's saying, he's saying... None is so fierce that dare stir up Satan. Now, what really gets me? You'll go to some Pentecostal church, a charismatic church. We got Satan by the tail. We got him whipped. Satan, you're beat. Ha ha, we got you. No. None is so fierce that they dare stir him up. In fact, even Michael the archangel would not rebuke Satan. He said, the Lord rebuked thee. We don't, when people think they've got Satan figured out, they have nothing figured out. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. 
I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. He's talking about Leviathan. Who can discover the face of his garment, or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to the another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his niecings, by his atisha, A-T-I-Y-S-H-A-H, A-T-I-Y-S-H-A-H, by his sneezing, a light doth shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot of cauldron. Now, perhaps this is what somebody read along the way to get the fire-breathing dragon, in all probability. God is just simply trying to show you and I the power of Satan, and the ferocity of Satan. And these evidently were words that meant something along this line to them. Let's continue reading. Out of his nostrils goes smoke, out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone, yea, as hard as a piece of nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. The spear of the dart, nor the habergeon. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood, the arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. And he's using the crocodile and Satan in the same picture here. Nothing can turn them back. Not with their technology of that day. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. And we know that crocodiles don't laugh, do we, don't we? Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Hori means gray or old or aged. Upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. And this is the part that shows this is much more than some wild animal in the sea that he's comparing this with. He is king over all the children of of pride this is definitely a picture of satan that he's comparing just like he's comparing the prince of tyre with satan he's comparing the leviathan of the deep or the animals of the deep whether it's a crocodile or whether it's a great whale he's comparing it with satan now That's right. And you can't put a hook in Satan's jaw. That's right. This is not about, it's not a book like I said on zoology. Because Satan comes to God. And all of this is about Satan bringing all of this up on Job. And God is simply telling Job, like you said, you cannot, you cannot put a hook in Satan's jaw and core out all these things that I'm allowing him or I have will for him to do to your life. 
I'm in charge of him. And you can't be in charge of him. And you can't straighten your life out. And this, there was a continuing exposition or dialogue going on between Job and his three friends and a young preacher named Elihu. And God's saying, you cannot put a hook in Satan's jaws and straighten out what I'm doing. I'm the one that's in charge of him. You cannot put him in check. And I just hate to hear some, and the verse I really love is that verse 10. None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? When he says that statement, he's talking about the Satan that has brought all these things upon Job and he compares him with one of the monsters of the deep that they're all afraid of. And he says, you can't put barbs in him like you can into some fish in the sea. You can't spear him. You can't put him in check, but I can. And that's what God does in the next chapter because Job goes back, if you go to the next chapter... Job answered the Lord and said, in the next chapter. Now let's go to the next chapter. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not Things too wonderful me for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare unto thee, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Job is not going to try to fix his life, or fix Satan's works in his life, or put a hook in Satan's jaws, or corral Satan in any kind of a way. What Job's going to do is bow to God. Because when he says none dare stirs him up, who's able to stand before me there in verse 10 of the previous chapter? And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, my, look here. God is wrapping things up in this last chapter. Why would he be talking about a crocodile and how hard it is to catch him in chapter 41? Huh? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? It is a picture of Satan because Satan starts out the book and God finishes it, but it reminds Job in chapter 41 who's doing the finishing. And he says, it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, verse 7, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, God is rectifying all of the wrong that's been done. And what he's saying in that 41st chapter, I have subdued Satan. You can't subdue him with hooks and spears. You can't even go out here and subdue a crocodile, or a whale. And you call that a literal Leviathan. This has to do with the literal and the spiritual. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. Of course, they were the ones correcting Job, saying, you did something wrong. That's why God's doing this to you. You're living some kind of bad life. That's what they say in a Pentecostal church, don't they? There's something wrong with you if you're sick. You just don't have any faith, Jim Brown. I think a lot of those people who used to tell me that 15 years ago when I was real sick, I think a lot of them are dead now. Or dying. Or they're real sick. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job, 
when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before then came there unto him, all his brethren, all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him, and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Let me read that again. The evil that the Lord had brought. So this is all about a confrontation between God and Satan. And God says, you can't stand against Leviathan, but I can stand against him. None dares stir him up. And who is able, who's able to stand before me if you can't control Satan? That's what the whole book is about. It's about Satan, and he uses Leviathan as an abstract picture. Every man hath given him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she-asses. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Kazia, and the name of the third Karen, Karen Hapuk. And in all the land there was no woman's, women so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them the inheritance among their brethren. After he, this, Job lived in 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. And the whole point is that God is the one who put the hooks in the jaws of Leviathan, speared Leviathan, and corralled him. At the end of the book, Leviathan is corralled. At the beginning of the book, Leviathan, or the serpent Satan, is going before God and accusing God and accusing Job. And God says, you cannot stand up against him, but I can. Now let's go back to the 13th chapter of I just wanted to put this in about Leviathan and that we could take a lot more time going through it by going a lot of these words, but we'll go on with the message. I got so much more. Now, let's go back to the 13th chapter. 13. I don't believe that's just talking about crocodiles. Do you? Don't believe that at all. And it's amazing some of them will say, well, it means Babylon, but it means crocodiles, and it means whales, but it means evil men, and it means, and it does, but you have to think the way they thought. If they said something, they would apply it. Abstract has the idea of keeping something open where it can apply anywhere. It's like baptism is water. You think it's water? Boom, you hit a brick wall and there's nowhere to go except just water. You say, that's all it is, it's water and it's immersion. You can't even answer, you can't even answer baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't even answer, I baptize the water, but there comes one after me. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You can't even answer the definition of baptism. You can't answer any of those answers. But when you're abstract... Let me see here. I've got a, I think I've got the word, read it out of, I've got it here, I believe. I thought I had it. Well, let me give you, let me give that to you. Let me just read it, read you the definition out of Webster's Dictionary. The reason you need to understand the word abstract, you can understand concrete. Concrete and abstract are opposite words. Concrete means exactly that. It's something that's solid. You can reach out and put your hands on. Concrete is, that's a table. It's, it's a kind of length and width thinking. Let me just give you this definition of abstract because we're talking in abstract terminology and they did this all the time. Abstract. To draw from separate. A thought Thought of apart from any particular instances are material objects. It's thought of apart from just actual material object. Well, it can only be a crocodile. It can only be Satan. It can be both at the same time. And that's what he's bringing out. Not concrete. Expressing a quality 
expressing a quality thought of apart from any particular material object, not easy to understand because of being extremely complex, remote from concrete reality, theoretical, not practical or applied, designating or of art abstracted from reality in which designs or forms be definite. And it's talking about when you see abstract painting and you go, what does that mean? Do you see what, and if you study paintings and you study colors and, they'll, and some will say, well, so-and-so does certain colors to get the idea of, give you this mood. I was in a, there's a, there was a famous piano player in Nashville years ago and I was over at his house talking to him and you can actually paint pictures and get real abstract with people's feelings. He was a brilliant piano player. His name was Bill Purcell. I guess the, isn't that the mayor's name? Well, his name is Bill Purcell. He's probably Bill's son, the mayor, because Bill Purcell was an old piano player, real famous, very good. And he said, he said, let me show you. He said, think of an evening in the summer. And it's just, and he started describing uh, he started describing hay being mown and the smell of leaves. He said, listen to this chord, foam. And I went, oh, man, that's, that feels like that. That chord feels like hearing that, like seeing all that. He said, there's things you can do with music. And that's what I'm talking about abstract. You can actually think that way in the Bible. That's the way the Bible is written and that's the way it's taught. And the reason Americans can't understand it is they think length and width and that's it. You understand what I'm saying? You can't just think length and width talking about the Bible. Especially when the Greek language was so broad and had such depth to it. And it had, they had musical tones to the words that we've lost long ago. So we can't even really fully understand the Greek context of some things because of just the musical tones we've lost. But we lost that thousands of years ago. Now, I want you to get to where you can think that way. Where you can apply and how many things do we teach like that? That's like saying, that's like saying seven stars. Seven stars in the right hand of Christ. Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion. Pleiades is seven stars. The rabbi said it drew the sap up in the vine. And brought the fruits in the spring. And the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And angels are messengers. Is that abstract thought? That is abstract, isn't it? And you're going, whoa. And the seven stars, the Pleiades is literal. And the seven angels of the seven churches are the seven stars, and they're spiritual. And they spoke in this terminology constantly. So when you're talking about Leviathan, you have to think of Leviathan being Satan and the beast the same way, the same way that the prince of Tyre was the anointed cherub in the Garden of Eden. And he dwelt in the midst of the sea, but he was only the king there, and he dwelt in the garden because it was Satan Satan in this man causing the fire and the tree worship to continue or the Christ mass system to continue. So when you're thinking Bible, I don't believe America is even taught to think in an abstract fashion. That's why the Church of Christ and Baptists can't understand baptism. Because when I say, when I talk about John saying he Christ baptized with... Uh, I baptize with water. He'll baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then Jesus will, say, go in, Jesus will say, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. You have to stop and ask yourself, say, wait a minute, Jesus, I want to ask you a question. Which baptism do you want me to baptize with? John's baptism or yours? 
That's abstract terminology, isn't it? Well, why would Jesus tell you to go to baptize with John's baptism when he's got one himself and it's spiritual? And that's why we don't baptize in water. If you can't think this way, you're going to miss the Bible. Now, let's go back to the 13th chapter of Revelation. And I just, from time to time, I'm going to pitch new things in there along the way. And even in the definitions, they'll say Babylon, the, the uh, Leviathan can be Babylon, or it can be evil men, or it can be a crocodile. You're going, well, how can I understand? Which one is it? It's not which one is it. When you're reading that 41st chapter of Job, God refers to the crocodile or catching Satan in the sense that you would catch a crocodile. So you, can't, you said you can't even catch a crocodile that way. How can you catch Satan that way? Now, let's go back to... You say, where did you get this kind of thinking? I don't know. God just made me think this way. I've thought this way since I was little. And I've always believed that there was some kind of analysis to the Scripture. If you think only concrete... That's why the Baptists won't even begin to investigate baptism. That's why they won't investigate predestination. That's why they won't investigate, well, I just can't see that. That's because they're not even willing to try to understand conceptual thinking. And they can't. Look over here in Revelation 13. Now, Revelation 13 chapter. Now, we're talking about how much time do I have, Mike? Nine. Goodness sakes. I thought I was about halfway through. Unbelievable. If you can get a hold of something like Leviathan, that'll help you. And you have to understand their feelings and their thought. If you don't study these books on culture and customs and idioms and metaphors, if you can't understand demons when they, when they said, it's a spirit, it's a phantasm, it's a fantasy. Fantasy to them meant some spiritual imaginary being that became real to them. That's what it meant. It was like some fairy tale being that they never saw during the day, but it was nighttime and they saw these creatures and they came out at night. And that's what the demons did. They lived at night and the vampires lived at night and the fairies were out at night dancing in the night and they had to get back to their cave or wherever they lived or their casket or their lair by the dawn. And you're back to what we was talking about this morning. Uh, keeping the demons at bay. Now, look here in the 13th chapter. We're talking about the two beasts. The first beast is an it. It is, it is the Babylonian system. Now, when someone says, when you're reading, when you're reading, uh, when you're looking at your Matthew Henry commentary, Matthew Henry and Matthew Poole, they lived a couple of hundred years ago, and they, 250 years ago, they were men. Their greatest enemy was the Roman Catholic Church. So you have to understand, when they come up and they say the beast, or the harlot is Roman Catholicism, and most men cannot see past, most men cannot see past Roman Catholicism into the past. Roman Catholicism is Babylonianism. That's what it is. Because Roman Catholicism came out of the Roman Empire, Roman Empire when it was outlawed and reinstituted in Roman Catholicism. Of course, Rome came out of out of Greece, and Greece came out of Persia, and Persia came out of Babylon. And Babylon overthrew the Assyrians. So all of this is one and the same. And it did evolve and change, and they added more rituals and all of this. 
but it all goes back to Babylon and Babylon's beginning at Babel where they got proud. And they were lifted up in their pride and all through the Bible when you find the word pride, it has to do with man's wickedness and his sin when they lifted themselves up and said, let us make up our own doctrine or let us make us a name. It all goes back to that. So when you get into the Roman Catholic, Catholic system, it's more than just Roman Catholicism. It's the system that began at Babel, the reinstitution of the Garden of Eden worship and the tree worship. I keep saying that. That's what everything is about. If you notice, Leviathan is the king of all the children of pride. Well, if that's true, pride goes back to Babel, doesn't it? And that goes back to the garden. Now, we're talking about, in this chapter, we're talking about two beasts and an image. That's what this chapter's about. Two beasts and an image, and I'm nearly out of time. I didn't mean to spend that much time on Leviathan. But if you, can, if you can get one thing like that out of a message, just one thing like that, and learn to think that way, I hope this challenges you to go home and study about Leviathan and get your dictionaries out and get on the Internet and say, let me see what I can find out about a Leviathan because you're going to hear all kinds of words about it. But like I say, study the sea and study their culture and their fears of the first century. Now, you've got... Two beast in an image. Two beast. Image in an image. The two beast are neuter gender. Neuter gender. Of course, gender means is it male or female? Is it man or woman? And neuter means it's neither. Uh, Marianne is female and Willie's male and the table is neuter. That's what it is. It's neuter. It's an it. It's a thing. So you've got the two beasts are neuter gender and the image is feminine gender. If the image of the beast is going to rise up and make the world worship the beast, the first beast, then the image has to be a religious system or Babylon the Babylon whore the Babylon harlot because it is feminine and it's going to make the world worship the beast now the second beast the second beast Second beast is the system of false prophet. When you say false prophet, you don't mean just a man. You're talking about all of the false prophet system because it is neuter gender. And we're talking about the doctrine that's going to be preached that speaks for the beast. And the, and the second beast creates this image, image or icon likeness to the beast. Now let's read the let's just read the rest of this chapter. In verse 13, this beast, this second beast, which is well, let's back up to verse 11. And I beheld another beast, neuter gender, coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb. It looked like Christ, and he spake as a dragon. It spake enchantment, or it spake fascination, it spake good words and fair speeches, and it exercises all the f power of the first beast. It's going to have the power of Babylon, Persia, and Greece, and Rome, and Roman Catholicism. It's going to have the power to rule the world. Before him, before it, and causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, that's the outlawing of the Roman Empire and reinstituted into Roman Catholicism, and it doeth great wonders, so that it maketh fire 
come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And we've said that's preaching false doctrine because fire from heaven is what the preachers of the Old Testament did. That's what Elijah did. He brought fire from heaven. And deceiveth them because he's not going to bring fire from heaven. Fire from heaven merely meant a man that was a man of God and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast. Now, that word miracle doesn't mean to raise somebody from the dead or cause them to see. It's just the word simeon. It means signal or, or sign or beacon. It's the same common word for sign throughout the New Testament when the Pharisees would say, give us a sign. I've run out of time, but let me read this verse and I'll come back and just take up right here next week. That they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Not an image to the second beast because it's the first beast or the Babylonian system that had the wound by the sword and did live. And it had power to give life unto the image of the beast. This is not talking about like these so-called prophecy teachers. Well, they're going to raise somebody from the dead. It's going to, I have heard preachers say, they're going to make this image. First of all, they call the beast a man. Now, this man gets shot in the head. It's real stupid. And then they make an image and they make him out of metal or something or out of some kind of metal and they, and, and they give life to it, and it walks around like some robot. That's dumb stuff. First of all, the first beast is a world system, and an image, icon, means a likeness or a representation of the first beast, and to give life to it doesn't mean to raise it or resurrect it from the dead or breathe literal breath into it. It's the same thing as giving life to a business. Man, that guy went over and started working for that company and he brought it to life well it didn't mean he went out there and made the machines literally go <laughs> and start breathing and gave him some lungs that's what this is talking about I'm out of time I'll have to come back next week and of course this image has the purpose of making the world both to speak and to cause that many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The image is going to cause those that don't worship the beast to be killed. You ought to keep that in mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Cause us to continue this message. Give us strength and courage and we'll give you the praise for everything. God, help us. We get distressed, get weary at times. Give us strength and courage to continue this work, and we'll give you the praise. In Christ's name, amen.